over the course of years, we know that mitochondria has much more bigger play role in our body as just, you know, as compared to just producing energy. You know, they control inflammation. They are regulators of autoimmune diseases. They control our immune function. They control our aging process. So all of those things, you know, along with energy production, we already know that a mitochondria Hello, play a everyone, role. everyone, and welcome back to another edition of your Adrenal Fixed podcast, where my mission is to tell the truth about adrenal fatigue to exhausted and burnt out adults so that they can get their health back quickly. And I'm really excited to introduce my next guest, Dr. Uh, Anshul Gupta. Uh, he's a board certified family medicine physician with advanced certification in functional medicine, peptide therapy, and is also a trained fellow in integrative medicine. He's worked at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic Department of Functional Medicine alongside Dr. Mark Hyman. And really now he specializes in treating Hashimoto disease and help people reverse their unresolved symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. So Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, um, I always like to get an idea on your own story because I have clients or, or an audience that are exhausted, that are burnt out, that aren't handling their stress very well, that crash in the middle of the day. They don't have focus. They don't have concentration. They don't have libido. They don't sleep. They don't wake up rejuvenated. And ultimately, I like to get your spin uh, as a traditional trained doctor on on why that's happening and how that's related to the thyroid and the adrenals and a different way to think about things and the connection between the two and we'll get into that but why don't you tell us your own story why you became a doctor and if you had any health challenges so that we can get a little bit of an understanding of how you got to where you got to yeah absolutely so like always say is that people who are enter the field of functional medicine almost everybody has their own personal health story or a family health story. So mine was more personal. So as you said, you know, I'm a trained family physician. So I got trained into the conventional side of the medicine. And then I started working in rural Virginia area. So there, you know, I started my family practice job. A couple of years into the job, I started having more health issues. So I started feeling fatigued. You know, I was having brain fog. I was having stomach issues and I was a, uh, how I was gaining more weight. Well, I was always a chubby kid, you know, as a child, but you know, that was cute and everybody loved it. So I never bothered, you know, like about it. And as I kind of, you know, grew older again, you know, even in conventional medicine, nobody kind of paid any attention to the weight. They said, Oh yeah, you are slightly overweight. That's pretty much it. You know, like, don't worry about it. Maybe, you know, like once you get older, you know, you need to figure something out. But now, you know, like my health was crashing. I was so fatigued by the end of the day that, you know, I was just literally in the evening, I was done. You know, I would just go to sleep and I would sleep for 10 hours sometimes. And still I will feel that, okay, well, I can catch up more. And then, you know, like I was having this horrible stomach pain. Nobody knew what to do with it. You know, I was a physician myself. So I thought, well, I'll start treating myself. So I started giving some medications, but it was not working. The pain was so horrible at times that, you know, I literally thought that I would need to go to the emergency room. But, you know, with my training, I knew the emergency room doctors can only give me pain medications. That's it. Because I did not have any other, you know, like significant symptoms. Well, after a couple of months, well, it was not getting better. So I was thought, well, I'm not smart enough. Maybe my other colleagues are smarter than me. So let me go to all these specialists. So I went to specialists after specialists, and then they kept on throwing things at me by doing endoscopies, ultrasounds, and all these different investigations. They keep on adding more and more medications, but in the end, I was still that same miserable person. I was still, I was still fatigued, I was still having stomach pain, I was gaining more weight, and nobody knew what to do with me. And I was just 32 at the time. So I was really scared. You know, at the time I was like, I don't know what to do. You know, like, will I be this miserable person the rest of my life, taking medications and feeling this way? And at that moment, you know, like there was this moment in my life, I was really scared and without hope. I was like, really, I don't have a choice. I don't know what to do. So then somebody actually introduced me to functional medicine and said, you know, like, why don't you look into that? So I started looking into functional medicine. And like, what I kind of realized was that every person in functional medicine was talking something similar to what I had. And everybody could relate to, you know, what I was going through. So I was like, okay, this is the place I need to be in because it seems like these guys have an answer for me. 
So I started like training into functional medicine and I started applying the principles. Within one month, my pain was gone. My stomach pain was gone. And within six months, I was off all medications. I was down 40 pounds. You know, I had more energy than I had ever in my life. You know, so that was a game changer for me. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like without any medications, with a few things, you know, like lifestyle changes and some supplements and things, this is huge. So I was like, I need to, you know, like kind of, you know, share with my clients, you know, I need to share with my patients because, you know, this is nobody's talking about it. And so many of my patients had similar issues as mine. But again, I was, because I didn't know what to do, I was just kind of kept referring them to one physician or one specialist to the other. So that's where I started to kind of thinking about functional medicine and I started working as a functional medicine physician. But then later on, I was working at the Cleveland Clinic Center of Functional Medicine. And then out there, I started seeing similar trend of some patients who had similar issues in mind. And all of them had Hashimoto's. And then all of them were tired. All of them had brain fog. All of them have weight issues. And they were all on medications, but they had no hope. They were still continuing to suffer. So I was like, oh, something similar to mine. I was in the same boat as these people, so I can completely relate to them. So I need to kind of do something about them. So that's where I started researching more about Hashimoto's and I started making a protocol. And then I started applying it and I saw phenomenal results. All of these clients, like all of my patients were getting so much better. You know, like their fatigue was gone. You know, like their brain fog was gone. They were able to lose weight. So that's where, you know, like now my passion is there to use this protocol to help as many, you know, Hashimoto's and thyroid patients as I can. Yeah, well, listen, that's an interesting story, Anshul. Thank you so much for sharing it. I, I think that once we've been through and identify what our clients or patients have gone through, we become a better teacher or doctor. We have more empathy. Um, we, we don't necessarily feel that just because the traditional approach uh, is unable to identify objectively what may be going on doesn't mean that there isn't something going on. And, and we talked a little bit before we got started here is the name of my website is called The Truth About Adrenal Fatigue. My mission is to tell the truth about adrenal fatigue. And I know that it's a very controversial subject. Uh, especially with the allopathic traditional approach and how it's defined. So why don't you give us your insights as to what exactly is adrenal fatigue um, as, it's, as, it, as a diagnosis? Um, is it real or how other ways we maybe want to think about that in terms of what it is? I know it's a, a, a vast question, but what's your, what's, what's your, your training and your opinion of what adrenal fatigue is and what may be a better way to define what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like since, you know, being a functional medicine physician, you know, I have been very, very fascinated with this, you know, adrenal glands, right? because we know so little about them, you know, like we only know about the dreadful, you know, like issues with adrenal gland where people have this Edison's disease or Cushing syndrome, whether they have either too much of the adrenal hormone or very little bit of the adrenal hormone. But I feel those are like two extremes, right? You know, an adrenal fatigue lies somewhere in the middle. So the conventional medicine is missing the point that, you know, like there are so many patients who lie in the middle and not on the extremes. And those are the patients who we see on the everyday basis, you know, who come to us saying that, okay, well, I'm doctor, I'm fatigued, and I don't know what I'm fatigued, you know, right? And then we, we check all the adrenal hormones, but they, they are so-called in the normal ranges or the ranges which we define, right? But, you know, like uh, they are still having symptoms. So we miss the point. So for me, adrenal fatigue is that if a patient is fatigued or not feeling great, doesn't have energy, he or she definitely has adrenal dysfunction, right? So the adrenal glands are not functioning optimally as they should be. Uh, and that's where we need to focus on. Now, the good part is that now with the new technologies, we have new testing available which are a little bit more better in checking those adrenal hormones, right? You know, the typical adrenal fatigue happens because of the cortisol hormone. So now we have these salivary cortisol testing where instead of just checking one point cortisol test, we check it at four different points, right? So that gives us a nice curve. That gives us a good idea about what is happening with those adrenal glands in the whole day. 
right? Because people, you know, like when I was uh, when I was traditionally trained, what I will do is I will I will check their cortisol levels just in the morning, right? And that will be perfectly be fine. But I don't know what is happening during the day, right? Because most of the people who have these adrenal fatigue, they have this crash later on in the day, right? That they do not feel great. And but we are not checking their cortisol levels at the time, so we do not know what the levels are. So with this new testing, I think they give us a good curve, a good idea of what is happening with their adrenals during the whole day. And I think that helps a lot in the diagnosis of so-called adrenal fatigue. So I think that's what is happening. And that's where I call it more as an adrenal dysfunction rather than like an adrenal disease. Um, and then that's with the way I approach my clients, you know, who come with fatigue and who, you know, have this adrenal dysfunction. Yeah, no, it's really refreshing to hear. And it, I, I do like the idea of somewhere in between. Um, there's a really good reference paper um, by Dr. Robert Navial, and he talks about the cell danger response. He has a second follow-up paper that talks about the healing cycle. And I did a, a lecture on that in the environmental uh, um, and mold uh, conference not too long ago. And what I talked about, Dr. Gupta, is... And what he talks about in that reference paper, and I, I will post that reference paper in the link for those that want to know more about that, is he talks about the need for in the medical approach is to define or write the second book of medicine. The first book is the acute based approach. And the second book is more of the chronic based approach, um, because we do go through a healing cycle where if it doesn't go from point A to point B to point C to point D, and it gets locked up somewhere, it's going to manifest as incomplete healing and fatigue. And it's not a reductionistic uh, pharmaceutical based approach as much as just take this or take that. So I would say it's not only better significant tests that we have available that are more sensitive, but it's also a new paradigm as to how we look at what's going on physiologically in the body. Um, and one thing you mentioned to me earlier is that you work with clients with Hashimoto's and that have more of a mitochondrial based problem. So can you explain what that actually means um, and why that's important for people that may now realize, okay, it's a dysfunction of the adrenal glands. It may not neither be low or neither be high. And somewhere in the middle, there's probably a new paradigm to define what's going on at the body. But what it, does this mitochondrial fatigue mean for me? And, and what is that? Yeah, so like, uh, just to kind of define mitochondria first, right? You know, most of us just know mitochondria as a powerhouse of our cell, right? Basically, what it means is that it is responsible for producing energy, right? You know, our body needs energy to function, and that's what mitochondria does. But now, over the course of years, we know that mitochondria has much more bigger play role in our body as just, you know, as compared to just producing energy. You know, they control inflammation. They are regulators of autoimmune diseases. They control our immune function. They control our aging process. So all of those things, you know, along with energy production, we already know that a mitochondria play a role. So now major role is in autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease that we know about. So in typically Hashimoto's, what we thought was that the antibodies that our body is producing is just destroying thyroid gland. So if we give them thyroid hormone, that will fix the issue. But in reality, what is happening is that these antibodies are not only destroying the thyroid gland, they're also destroying the mitochondria. So all of those symptoms which actually are feeling with Hashimoto's are because of mitochondrial dysfunction. You know, we know that, you know, fatigue is a, is a symptom of mitochondrial dysfunction. We know brain fog is a symptom of mitochondrial dysfunction. Hair loss is also connected with mitochondria. Obesity is connected now with mitochondria. So each and every, you know, symptom that is where with Hashimoto's is actually because of mitochondrial dysfunction, but we were totally neglecting it. We thought, okay, it is because of thyroid. So let's give them thyroid hormone and that will fix the issue. But in reality, that is not doing it. So that's where, you know, we need to start focusing on mitochondrial health in Hashimoto's patients. So for them to get better with it, and then, then that's the only way we can resolve all of these symptoms which are associated with it. Yeah, that's a great answer. But I think also what's needed is just like 
there's black and white and not very many shades of gray in the assessment of the adrenal glands, either too high or too low. It's kind of the same thing with the mitochondria. Tell us about like the traditional approach when you tell a allopathic trained doctor that may not necessarily be in the functional medicine world, what they think of as a mitochondrial problem. They typically think of as a major debilitating illness that doesn't have a long lifespan. What, what's the traditional approach to what mitochondrial defunction, dysfunction is? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. You know, like the traditional, you know, doctors or physicians still do not recognize like, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction. You know, like there are certain mitochondrial diseases, but those are very, very rare and those are very, very severe. As you said, for mitochondrial disease to happen, people are basically, you know, like bedridden or they have these dreadful symptoms that, you know, their lifespan is not much, right? So they do not think that they can even reach adulthood, right? These are all childhood diseases. People might make it to their, you know, like teens or like to, you know, to middle-aged middle -aged adults, that's it. But... Now we are recognizing that, you know, with the new research that there is uh, somewhere again in the middle where a lot of these diseases have mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, the problem is that we do not still have a perfect test to check for mitochondrial dysfunction. So again, with, you know, being an allopathic physician, if somebody says, okay, well, how do I check for it? You know, like there is no perfect test for it. So that's what we are lacking. And that's where I think the new research is coming up to kind of find ways to check mitochondrial dysfunction and actually, there is a lot of new research coming up, you know, with the pharmaceutical industry of targeting mitochondria and different autoimmune diseases and even in cancer. So they're already working on it uh, with, you know, therapeutic potentials for it. And then on the other hand, first, we need to have a test, you know, which, you know, is widely available. Anybody can use it to kind of check for it. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Um, I had an interview with an authority on nitric oxide and talked about the importance of nitric oxide for mitochondrial health. Um, and then I think like, like any good functional medicine practitioner, they put all the puzzle pieces together, the history, um, the, the, the objective laboratories, and um, the ability to understand the role of environment and mindset to get an overall clinical picture. So um, I want to switch it up because one of the things that we, we agreed to talk to, which I think would be very valuable, is really understanding the difference between, um, even though it's at the fundamental level, mitochondria that's being impacted from the stress response, from the environment, from life, from exposures, from everything else in between, can you tell me what, how you look at and discern the difference between if it's a thyroid problem or if it's an adrenal problem? Why don't you tell us a little bit about your insights on that, Dr. Gupta? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so that's a big question that comes to me a lot of times, you know, like because of these, you know, Hashimoto's or thyroid clients I see every day, right? Now, is that the fatigue that they're experiencing is because of the thyroid issues or is it because of the adrenal issues? Now, first of all, you know, like they are all connected, right? You know, like because functional medicine, you know, like we are not just different pieces, right? You know, we are all, our all organ systems are connected to each other. The same is with thyroid and adrenal glands that they have a strong connection with each other. So one is not working properly. The other does get affected. But a lot of times, you know, like we can certain times we can differentiate whether the major problem is because of the thyroid gland or the major problem is because of the adrenal gland. So some ways you can differentiate is that the first thing, you know, like we can, uh, we can see is that the people, you know, who, who have adrenal fatigue, these are the people which we call as wired and tired. Okay. That these have like, you know, anxiety issues and they're always like in the hyper mode, they're always wired, but then at the same time, they're also all the time tired that this cannot function. While the thyroid people, you know, if you have thyroid fatigue, most of these people have like low energy and they feel like low mood, like they have more depression issues and things. So that's one differentiating factor that's very, very important. I see all the time. Now, the second issue that I see with, you know, the difference is the fatigue, the thyroid fatigue, you know, generally happens again, like later in the day or is there for only a certain amount of time. Well, most people with adrenal fatigue, they are fatigued all the time. Like they say that when we wake up in the morning, we just feel tired. And like by midday, we are just done. Like, you know, there is nothing else that we can do in the day. So those are the people like, you know, they wake up tired and then they are tired during the day and the night. So the sleep and all those things will help them out. But 
they just feel tired all the time. Well, tired patients, they feel okay during the morning. And as the day goes on, you know, the fatigue happens either later afternoon or in the evening time. The third thing is skin. So what happens is that, you know, in, in thyroid, the skin is very, very dry. So we see typical dry skin in thyroid patients. Well, people who have adrenal dysfunction, their skin is very, very fragile. Like most people will come and tell me that, you know, like I just hit, you know, like a knob or a door or I just brush, you know, like through a table and my skin will break, you know, like, so it's very, very thin and fragile. And they are, these are young people, you know, like we see this happening like later on, like in 70s and 80s but not in people with like 40s, right? So that's the difference between thyroid and adrenal glands, where adrenal will have fragile skin, while thyroid will have more dry skin, but not very, very fragile. And the last difference is the weight. So most people who have adrenal dysfunction will have this weight, which is centered around their waist. Like they have this, you know, uh, they will say that, you know, my, all my weight is around my waist, which is I'm not able to lose it. Well, with thyroid patients, the weight, you know, is more so in generalized all over the body, more so in their thighs and buttocks and all those places. So that's all the differences that, you know, I have seen over the course of time in my practice. That's the way I can differentiate sometimes, like where it is with thyroid and where it is actually adrenal glands, which is causing the issue. Okay, excellent. Very, very good information for sure. And like you said, there always is the connection um, between the two um, in that they're regulated um, with the same uh, mechanism in the brain that will ultimately crosstalk between each other um, and ultimately getting to the root of the problem, whether it's a thyroid presentation or adrenal presentation is, is always the goal. But with that being said, let's say someone comes in and you do your workup, Dr. Gupta, and you find that they're more of an adrenal-based client or a, more of a thyroid-based condition, and your goal is to get to the root cause of the problem and address that. But at the, at the supporting level, while you're working to work upstream to help them, how would your treatment approach differ between the two? So the way, you know, like I will approach, if it is like more of a thyroid client, then we will start with fixing a lot of their thyroid issues first. You know, like obviously the root is, you know, like we need to figure out the root, right? Whether it is, as you said, whether it is a toxins, whether it is stress, you know, whether it is their inflammation, whether it is infections, you know, like you name it, right? We need to figure that out. But initially these people are so much suffering that we need to give them some hope. So that hope differs from person to person. So if it is a thyroid client, I will start with more supplement, which will be supporting the thyroid, which will be, you know, like the selenium, the zinc, the vitamin D, the magnesium, you know, like all of those supplements and then food, which are high in iodine. So all of those things, you know, I will definitely get on board for these, you know, like people with thyroid clients. Now, if they have adrenal dysfunction, those are a little bit difficult to treat, you know, from get go. So then, you know, for those people, I will start, you know, with a lot of lifestyle changes, especially focusing on the stress, because definitely stress plays a huge, huge role in adrenal dysfunction. So I definitely want to get to the issue what why, why are they stressed out and then start making small, small lifestyle changes, you know, just kind of taking a few minutes of deep breathing or like I'm introducing to the practice of meditation or like just journaling, like just simple steps, which, you know, they can follow along. And then the second of all, you know, I use supplements to support adrenal glands, which is like adaptogens. So those are my favorite things, you know, like I recommend to a lot of my clients, you know, like ashwagandha is one of my favorite ones, like ginseng, rhodiola. So those are all great ones, you know, like adaptogens that I use in my practice a lot, especially people who have adrenal dysfunction. Um, so that's where I combine the lifestyle of working on the stress management with these adaptogens for my adrenal folks. While with the thyroid folks, definitely we work on the lifestyle, but a lot of times we start with, you know, fixing their thyroid gland with the supplements, which are more focused towards the thyroid, you know, and that's, that's kind of the difference that I will say, I will, I will start with the approach. Right. Okay. That's a great answer. While looking upstream and, and seeing what is, is initiating either or, or both. Right. And yeah. so, okay. The other thing I was really interested in Dr. Gupta is you mentioned you do peptide uh, therapy as well. 
So why don't you tell us what is peptide therapy and what are some of the applications beyond focusing on the root cause and then supporting specific adrenal and thyroid protocols? What, what is, how does peptides fit in? Yeah, absolutely. So peptide therapy is actually an emerging new therapy that, you know, we are kind of, you know, uh, knowing more about. So what are peptides? So peptides are actually natural chemicals, which our body produces all the time. So now, now we know about amino acids, right? So basically peptides are a very, very small collection of amino acids, which, you know, like have signaling potential. Now people will say, okay, well, are peptides proteins? So I say, well, they are a little bit different. Proteins are definitely collection of amino acids, but those are collection of long chains of amino acids. Well, peptides are a very, very small kind of, you know, chains of amino acids, which does a lot of work, which is basically signaling work. Like, so basically they signal the cell to perform different activities. So they, a lot of times they control inflammation, you know, a lot of times they kind of control how our body responds to like external environment. They control immunity in our body and a whole bunch of things. So the oldest peptide that we know about is insulin. So insulin is actually a peptide. So in 1960s is, you know, the first time where we were able to produce insulin. And that's the first peptide that we, you know, got introduced to and almost everybody, you know, you know, like knows about insulin now. So the, so the issue with peptides that why we were not able to produce more peptides into more therapeutic potential was that, that we were not able to make them stable, right? So we know about peptides, which are present in our body, but we were not able to produce peptides outside of our body uh, because they were not stable. But over the course of years with new technology coming in, now the peptides are big, we, have, we are able to make them more stable, like shell stable. And the second problem was that as soon as we will consume those peptides, the body will break them down. You know, our body's enzymes, our body's defense mechanism will break them down. So they were not able to do the job. But now again, with new technology, what we are able to do is that we, are, we can combine them or we can, you know, like manufacture them in a certain way where the body, you know, they are able to survive in the body and they can do their job. So the, now the peptide therapy, when it comes in, when it when actually started off, people were using a lot of these peptides for basically like weight loss and also especially for building muscles. So growth hormone was the most common peptide that was in, initially introduced. It was called anti-aging. It was called, you know, like about like gaining muscle mass and all that stuff. But it has a lot of like side effects and potential, you know, with, you know, like causing issues or problems with people. So then that's where, you know, now we have more safer peptides, which has more vital potential. So now again, fitness industry is the, is the number one industry, which still uses these peptides, you know, like, which has, which are like not growth hormone, but now these are like growth hormone secretor cox, which basically helps to secrete the growth hormone, but these are not directly growth hormone. So these are, some of them are like CJC and epimodulin. Those are the most common ones which are used in the fitness industry, which helps with weight loss and also kind of helps with, uh, as I said, anti-aging potential, you know, helps with sleeping and all that stuff. The other peptides that we're using, one is called BPC. So that is a healing peptide. So helps with healing a lot. So helps with wound healing, you know, it works for healing in your GI tract. So a lot of people who have leaky gut, you know, or people have, you know, like uh, gut issues, you know, we use BPC a lot. The other class of peptides, you know, are called uh, thymosin alpha one. So this is a peptide which regulate your immune function. So this is a peptide, you know, which has been useful for autoimmune diseases or lowering inflammation. And then it has actually also, it has some antimicrobial properties too. So there are some research studies which, you know, show that it can be helpful for, for hepatitis patients. So this is kind of a broad range of peptides which are available. There are many more available, you know, like uh, especially in diabetes field, we have a new peptide called GLP-1, which is called Victoza. So that's another peptide that, you know, which has came into the market. Um, so that's, that's a big broader use. Now, the question was that, you know, is there any use for these peptides in adrenal dysfunction or thyroid dysfunction? So these peptides, you know, definitely work indirectly. So like in thyroid dysfunction, a lot of people have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. So I use thymosin alpha one a lot of times for these clients, because that helps them to reduce the inflammation that balances their autoimmune process. 
so that way you know we can improve their antibody levels and all those things now the other peptides which are like growth hormone you know like you know receptor agonists and all those things those help with sleeping so that helps with like you know like we know that sleep is essential for a lot of people for adrenal dysfunction so a lot of you know clients after i use them the first of all they help them to weight, lose weight you know like they help them to lose fat and then and help gain muscle but the the biggest benefit they see is that you know they sleep really very good so i think that's an indirect benefit for a lot of people with with adrenal dysfunction that these can be useful for excellent so are those mainly used um i know peptides have to be do all peptides have to be injectable or are they are able to be taken early how are they administered yeah almost all of them are injectables now we have a new kind of peptide there is one company which is making a bpc as a oral form but i don't see great results with it so still like yes all of the peptides are injectables the reason being i shared with you that you know like uh, if you take them orally your body just digests them and that's the reason you know like if it breaks down in your gi tract then they cannot function so we are still not in the process you know like we have not yet have mastered the technology that we have those peptides which can be taken orally most of them are injectable which is like a subcut injection which is like how people give insulin injections like you know very like very small needle that they can use and they can use you know gently around their stomach is you know like or their you know like lower abdomen is what they use for inject these peptides okay excellent yeah there's a lot of hope and 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 a lot of encouragement for these peptide therapies i i have my own theory in terms of the protein demand and supply inequality so when i do a functional medicine assessment typically i see values that suggest um protein depletion or i tell them there's a protein uh demand and supply problem where if your immune system's upregulated and there's lots of inflammation and stress that's going to be increased demand um but on top of that if you have microbial concerns absorption issues gi dis dis dysbiosis that's going to decrease the dem- the supply and then ultimately part of the enzymatic uh construction with with proteins necessity peptide use uh or peptide um requirements for proteins um just the the actual um the cellular uh, matrix of the of the of the cell requiring protein immunoglobulins requiring proteins you're at a loss you're it's like i tell people you're working in new york and you're working at minimum wage you're not keeping up with the demand and supply of protein availability which impacts the signaling challenges and then to be able to give uh these stable peptides in in an injectable form will really leapfrog ahead of some of the challenges that someone has with just taking amino acids. So that's my theory anyways in terms of why peptides would be so helpful. So listen, I appreciate your time. I know we could talk further. Um but what I want to do is I want to ask you in a follow-up last question. Um I always ask this of my guests, um knowing what you know now, uh what would you have told the younger version of yourself um for for health purposes for better quality of life purposes for just sage wisdom purposes um what words of advice or encouragement or wisdom would you have had for the younger ancho well the only advice that you i have found useful and i will always in like as you said like if i was like you know like 10 years ago if i knew about it is that manage your stress properly have a game plan to manage the stress because stress is going to eat you up stress is going to like you know create a havoc in your life and definitely it builds up and you are going to bound to have health issues later on and we all ignore it we never plan to have stress management and the the, the key is that start slow like just have few minutes for yourself a day you don't have to have an hour or like 3 hours or 4 hours to kind of you know de stress just few minutes but be consistent with it and use it wisely. Oh, that's great advice. Excellent advice. So, now let's say I want to learn a little bit more about you. Um I know you have some social media and some and a website. Where do I go to find out more about you, Dr. Gupta? Yeah, the best way to learn more about me is going on my website, which is anshulguptamd.com. 
uh, I have an active blog on my website where, uh, you know, again, I'm a research based person. So I write a blog about various new research, which is coming up, which is related to thyroid, adrenal glands and all those things. So people can people can follow me along over there. Obviously, you know, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is Anshul Gupta MD. So because I'm very active on Instagram and I kind of post a lot of useful information over there. So people can find me over there also. Awesome. So just to spell it out, it's A N S H U L G U P T A dot com, or is it M D in there? M D in there. Okay. So A N S H U L G U P T A M D dot com. Yes. Awesome. And the same thing for the the Instagram as well. Awesome. Right. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. Um, we, it goes by very quickly and uh, I would love to get some more insight um, down the road and keep an open invitation to talk once again. And um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you and your forthcoming nature of telling us your, your impression of, of what's going on in the world and what's going on with health and um, being open to um, the new information and applying it to your clients to, to help change the world and get people healthy. So thank you for what you do. Well, I really appreciate you having me on the show and I'm, I really like what you have been doing, especially dealing with such a controversial topic, as you said, but that's what we need to do. We need to talk about, you know, like tough things, you know, in the, in this world so that, you know, everybody has a voice, but people need it, you know, so I really appreciate what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Well, good. So you have a good rest of your day, Anshul, and uh, we will catch up again soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.